Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. This is the first day that I am starting the Love Dare um, challenge. It is a marriage Christian challenge. It's a 40 day challenge and um, if you hadn't seen the videos before this, I kind of explained what it is. And also there's a free online anonymous love test that you can take about your marriage and gives you some strengths and stuff to work on. Um, but today is actually the first day that I am going to be working out of it. I'm not really sure how the best way to go about it is. Um, but right now I'm just going to kind of, um, I'm going to read the introduction part of it first. And then I'm going to go into the first day. And... I'm not sure this is how it's going to be for the whole 40 day challenge. I'm just going to see how it goes and how people respond to it. Um, the Love Dare, like I said, it's a 40 day challenge. Um, it's by Stephen Alex Kendrick. And let me get started. It says, now let's begin. And this is the introduction. The scriptures say that God designed and created marriage as a good thing. It is a beautiful, priceless gift. He uses marriage to help eliminate loneliness, multiply our effectiveness, establish families, raise children, enjoy life, and bless us with relational intimacy. But beyond this, marriage also shows us our need to grow and deal with our own issues and self-centeredness through the help of a lifelong partner. If we are teachable, we will learn to do the one thing that is most important in marriage, to love. The powerful union provides a path for you to learn how to love another imperfect person unconditionally. It is wonderful. It is difficult. It is life-changing. This book is about love. It's about learning and daring to live a life filled with loving relationships. And this journey begins with the person who is closest to you, your spouse. May God bless you as you begin this venture, but be sure of this, it will take courage. If you accept this dare, you must take the view that instead of following your heart, you're choosing to lead it. The world tells you to follow your heart, but if you are not leading it, then someone or something else is. The Bible says the heart is more deceitful than all else, and that's in Jer Jeremiah 17, 9. And it'll always pursue that which feels right at the moment. We dare you to think differently. Choosing instead to lead your heart toward that which is best in the long run. This is a key to lasting, fulfilling relationships. The love dare journey is not a process of trying to change your spouse to the person you want them to be. You have no doubt already discovered the efforts to change your husband or wife have ended in failure and frustration. Whether this is a journey exploring and demonstrating genuine love, even when your desire is dry and your motives are feeling low, the truth is love is a decision and not just a feeling. It is selfish, sacrificial, and tra transformational. And when love is truly demonstrated it, as it was intended, your relationship is much more likely to change for the better. Each day of the journey will contain three very important elements. First, a unique aspect of love will be discussed. Reach of these carefully and be open to a new understanding of what it means to genuinely love someone. Second, you'll be given a specific dare to do for your spouse. Some will be easy and some will be very challenging but take each dare seriously and be creative and courageous enough to tempt it. Don't be discouraged if, uh, if outside situations prevent you from accomplishing the specific dare. Just pick back up as soon as you can proceed with the journey. Last, you'll be giving a journal space to log what you are learning and doing and how your spouse is responding. Take advantage of the space to capture what is happening with both you and your mate. The notes will record your progress and become priceless and help of, helpful to you in your future. Remember you have the responsibility to protect and guide your heart. Don't give up and don't get discouraged. Resolve to lead your heart and make it through to the end. 
Learning to truly love is one of the most important things you will ever do. Now these three remain, faith, love, and faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, and that's in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. If I speak with you the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have the love, I have become a no noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. All right, so that was the introduction. Um, if that sounds interesting to you, please continue with me. Because this is day number one, and it is um, called Love is Patient. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4 2. And sorry if you can hear James talking in the background because he is sitting there talking to the dog. <laughs> Alright, so I'm not really sure if this is really the best way to go about it, but I'm just going to read you what it said and then some of the parts I'm going to have written what how I feel about what that says and how it is in our relationship. But um, it first said, Love works. It is life's purest and most power motivator and has far greater depth and meaning than most people realize. It gives the courage to a coward, wisdom to a fool. It always does what is best for others and empowers to face the greatest of problems. Love can motivate a man to put away childish things, provide for his family, and take passionate stands for what he believes in, like crossing an ocean to fight for his country. Love can drive a woman to connect emotionally in relationships, comfort the hurting around her, protect her children, and extend her hands in kindness to those in need. We are born with a lifelong thirst for love. Our hearts desperately need it, like our lungs need oxygen. Love changes our motivation for living. Relationships become meaningful with it. No marriage is successful without it. Love is built on two pillars. The best define what it is. Those pillars are patience and kindness. All other characteristics of love are extensions of these two attributes. And that's where you dare will love where your dare will begin with patience. Love inspires you to become a patient person. When you choose to be patient, you respond in a positive way to negative situation. You are slow to anger. You choose to have a long fuse instead of a quick temper. Rather than being restless and demanding, love helps you settle down and begin extending mercy to those around you. No one likes to be around impatient people. Impatience overacts in angry, foolish, re regrettable ways. But the irony of anger towards a wrong is that it spawns new wrongs of its own. Anger almost never takes things better. In fact, it usually generates additional problems. It will trample on long-term relationships by reacting in the short-term mishaps. Okay, so I, I had some notes in my book. I um, underlined impatience, overreacts in angry, foolish, regrettable ways. And then underlined spawns new wrongs of its own. Anger almost never makes things better, usually generates additional problems. And I believe this is true with children, too. Um, I feel like James reacts worse when we react with anger. And, um, yeah, if we're yelling at him, I feel like it just makes the situation worse. Um, but when we talk more in a calm but firm way, I, I definitely feel like that it... It's more productive, um, so I feel, feel like that also, not just works with your spouse, but also with your children. Next is, but patience stops problems in their tracks. More than biting your lip, more than clasping a hand over your mouth, patience takes a needed deep breath. It clears the air. It stops fullness from whipping its scorpion tail all over the room. Patience is a choice to control your emotions rather than allowing your emotions to control you. 
and shows discretion instead of returning evil for evil. It brings an internal calm to an external storm. If your spouse offends you, do you quickly retaliate or do you stay under control? Do you find that anger is your emotional default when treated unfairly? If so, are you spreading poison rather than medicine? And I wrote, I get defensive. I feel like I have a lot of patience. Or put up a, I feel like I have a lot of patience. So, I do get defensive though. If you were to take off its mask, you see that anger is often an emotional reaction flowing out of your ignorance, foolishness, and selfishness. Patience, however, makes us wise. It says, help me understand instead of how dare you. It doesn't rush to judgment, but puts our feelings on pause so that we can fully listen to what the other person is saying. It stands in the doorway where anger is clawing to burst in, but waits to see the whole picture before determining its best response. The Bible says, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick, tempered, exalts fully. Proverbs 14, 29 As sure as a lack of patience will turn your home into a war zone, the practice of patience will foster peace and quiet. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. Proverbs 15, 18. Statements like these from the Bible, but Proverbs, are clear principles with timeless reverence. Patience is where love meets wisdom, and every marriage needs to be the combination to stay healthy. Love helps you give your spouse permission to be human. It understands that everyone fails daily. So when they make a mistake, you, it patiently chooses to give them more time than they deserve to correct it. Patient gives you the amazing ability to hold on during the tough times in your relationships rather than bailing out under the pressure. So test yourself. How long is your fuse? How quickly do you adopt a bad attitude? Are you willing to wait with a smile? Can your spouse count on having a patient wife or husband to deal with? Can she know the, that locking her keys in the car will be met by a calm and understanding rather than a demeaning lecture that makes her feel childless? Can he know that being found watching football game will automatically invite a loud mouth laundry list of better ways he should be spending his time? I um, underlined, locking her keys in the car will be met by a calm understanding rather than a demeaning lecture that makes her feel childless childless and it's and I wrote hard for me or <laughs> um one uh one time or I think there might be a couple of times I um burned dinner and I got I got really upset about it and um I ran to the bedroom crying laying down on the bed crying and David was very um, understanding and he said it's okay and, and that it wasn't that big of a deal I just felt really bad because it was our dinner and I ruined it but, um, so David was really sweet about that and I don't care if he watches the football game I like watching football too so anyway let's keep going it says what would the tone and volume of your home be like if you tried the biblical approach see that no one repays another with evil for evil but always seek after you after that, which is good for one another. And that's 1 Thessalonians 5.15. Few of us do patience very well, and none of us do it naturally. But the wise men and women pursue it in an essential ingredient to their marriage relationships. That's good starting point to demonstrate to true love. The love dare journey is a process, and the first thing you must resolve to do is to demonstrate patience on a daily basis. Think of it as a marathon, not a sprint, but it's a race worth running. Since we should never stop loving, we should never stop showing patience. It should be refreshed in the supply every morning as the sun rises. All right, today's dare, it says, the first part of the stare is fairly simple. 
Although love is communicated in a number of ways, our words often reflect the condition of our hearts. For patience and to say nothing negative to your spouse at all. If the temptation arises, choose not to say anything. It's better to hold your tongue than to say something you'll regret. And then um, gives you like a little area to check off once you completed it. Um, and then it goes on to say, did anything happen to cause anger toward you, toward your mate? Were you tempted to think disapproving thoughts and let them come out in words? How did you handle that? Um, I've already written down some stuff, but um, that was from when I did this. A year ago or so so um, I'll kind of show you what another one looks like like here's way down the line it gives you the there and then it has a question and then you go in and fill in with your journal not every love there book has this um, but the journal ones do so that's why I like this journal one so you can go in and write it um, but yeah, that's where I'm going to stop right now. And oh, let me re read these real quick. It says, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's in James 1.19. Put your heart and soul into this, and you will see the change soon. And it says, Elma. But um, yeah. So um, I'm going to come back. Well, I'm not stopping the video right this here. But that's where I'm stopping for today. Because I am going to work on that dare. Then I'm going to come back and write in this, um, wh what it was that I worked on. And while well, I want to see if, if I get angry towards David tonight um, when he gets home. And maybe through tomorrow morning. And see if I had, was tempted to think disapproving thoughts. And let them come out in words. Hopefully, if I feel like it, then I'll just stay quiet. And then I'll come back and we'll next see how I did with that. All right. Hi, guys. So it is about bedtime, but I wanted to go over my um, Love is Patient Dare for today. Um, I'm getting ready for bed and David it's actually his night to put James down so that's what he's doing right now the dare so mostly the patience that I had to do was more involving like James I know this is more of a marriage thing but um, I think David and I both have been trying to work on having patience with James he's three and as David likes to say, he is a three-nature. Um, he's just wanting independence and he's learning and trying to figure out who he is and what he can get away with and what he's supposed to be, you know, this typical stages of being three. And when I was making the um, vlog about um, the introduction and, and the love um, test that I have already posted, um, Jane went and did, or got some couscous out of the kitchen, and it's a big jar of it, and you, if you ever bought couscous, you know that it is not cheap. And he, um, well, the way I figured out what happened was that our dog came into the office where I was doing the, doing the videos, and he was kind of choking. And I looked at his lips and I saw couscous and I was like, James, what, what did you do? And, uh, I came into the, um, back living room and there was couscous everywhere. It's just like he poured out the couscous and that I was stressed. I was trying to have patience. I may have not had the best of patience, but vacuuming it up and everything and while I was cleaning that up James was in the other room and the kitchen where we have the cat and dog food and he was putting the cat food and dog food in their water and it was all over the kitchen floor and um I, I just trying to have 
patience with James. Um, I know, like I said before, he's three and he's trying to figure out, you know, who he is and what he can get away with and his independence and everything. And I'm not coming up with the right words right now, but for the most part, I think it's normal. But um, the same th thing is I, I know he knows that there's a baby coming in less than a month now. As you're re I'm watching this, the baby's already here, but we have in less than a month, as right now, he is, um, I feel like he's showing maybe some anxiety. Um, David isn't really sure, it, it, like he really understands, but I think he does. And I've talked to some other people and they all think he um, is definitely showing some anxiety. You know, he just doesn't, he knows his world's about to change, or maybe he doesn't understand fully his life's about to change, but he knows it, that it's not going to be the same or he can, it's already changing. And um, we try to talk to him about the baby coming and everything. So, I don't know. I think he's just acting out because of that too. And so David and I, I think we're both, we ha have been close to hitting our limits a couple of times with our patience. But that's mostly where our, my patience, I've been having to have patience. When it comes to the patience we I have with David, um, today we were driving to take James to see Santa Claus and um, I, w I was driving and David was trying to tell me directions how to get there and he if I messed up it was dark and I didn't really know where I was going so I was missing a couple of streets and, and David would say something kind of sarcastic to me and <laughs> Uh, I would just, I did my very best to just kind of go with the flow and just be like, okay, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean to do that. And, uh, and then he was like, well, you don't have to be sorry. I don't know. I was just trying to have patience with his um, back seat driving, but he was in the uh, passenger seat. And at one point, I was about to say something negative back to him. But I said, no, I'm not going to say it. And he was like, what were you going to say? I said, no, I'm not going to say anything mean or negative. And he he apologized for doing what he, saying what he had said. And then and then when we were leaving um, after Santa Claus, he uh, was questioning me about, because I don't like to, I, as I age, I don't like to drive in the dark as much. Just because, especially where, where we were, it was really dark, there's hardly any lights. And then he was questioning me. I took a different way than I usually do, or he usually goes. And he asked me why I went that way. And I turned around and started going the way he had mentioned. And he was like, well, I was just questioning you, or questioning doesn't mean you have to change what you were doing. That, and I can't remember the exact words he was saying, but I was just let it go <laughs> I was just like I don't know I just I'm sorry and I was that was how I was having patience today I was just telling him or wasn't saying anything I wasn't yelling at him not yelling I wouldn't yell but I wouldn't go back and say something that I usually would say that would be negative and we would get into a small argument I just let it roll off and I'm glad I did that so I believe, I believe that's all for today's dare. Um, stay around, and tomorrow is Love is Kind, and we're going to go over the devotional for that tomorrow, and hopefully I will have finished the dare tomorrow. So, me, hopefully I'll do something kind tomorrow. So, <laughs> Hey guys, sorry I look like a hot mess. <laughs> um, I would just been doing housework today so I haven't gotten ready but I want to go ahead and get on here and do the second day of the love dare um, today is day two and it says love is kind it says be to one another tender-hearted forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you and that's Ephesians 4 32 
It says, kindness is love in action. If patience is how love reacts in order to minimize a negative circumstance, kindness is how love acts to maximize a positive circumstance. Patient, uh, patience avoids a problem. Kindness creates a blessing. One is preventative, the other proactive. These two sides of love are the cornerstones of which may, many of the other attri attributes we will discuss are built. And I underlined, if patience is how love reacts in order to minimize a negative circumstance, kindness is how love acts to maximize a positive circumstance. Love makes you kind and kindness makes you likable. When you're kind, people want to be around you. Makes sense, right? <laughs> um, I want to be around people who are kind. You don't want to be around people who are mean to you all the time, right? They see you as being good to them and good for them. The Bible keys in on the importance of kindness. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Proverbs 3, 3 through 4. Hello, Proverbs. If I ever just feel like I need to get in there or in the Bible and just um, improve my life and do better, Proverbs is the place where I go. It says, kind people simply find favor wherever they go, even at home. But kindness can feel a little generic when you try defining it, much less living it. So let's break down kindness into four basic core ingredients. The first one is initiative. Kindness thinks ahead, then takes the first step. No, re no request required. It doesn't sit there waiting to be prompted or coursed before getting off the couch. The kind of husband or wife will be the one who greets first, smiles first, serves first, and forgives first. And I underlined that. Um, I need to work on this a little bit. Um, when David gets home from work, sometimes I'm just sitting in front of the couch watching TV or on, on the couch watching TV because I'm just tired because of the day and <laughs> taking care of James and he's the one that has to walk in there and be like hey I'm home but I need to get off the couch and welcome him just like James does when he when uh, David gets home James always runs up to him and says I love him he loves him and misses him so maybe I need to take a lesson from James they don't require the other two get his or her act together before showing love. When acting from kindness, you see the need and then you quickly make your move first. Next is gentleness. When you're operating from kindness, you're careful how you treat your spouse, never being unnecessary, callous, or harsh. You're sensitive, tender. Even if you need to say hard things, you'll bend over backwards to make a rebuke or challenge as an easy to hear as possible. You speak the truth in love. The next one is helplessness. Sorry if you can hear James in the other room. <laughs> um, being, oh, help, helpfulness. Being kind means you meet the needs of the moment. If it's housework, you get busy. A listening ear, you give it. Kindness graces a wife with the ability to serve her husband without worrying about her rights. I underlined, if it's housework, you get busy. A listening ear, you give it. Kindness grace of a wife with the ability to serve her husband without worrying about her rights. Because I need to work on these. I can be a little bit of a procrastinator. Even though I've been work, trying to work hard on it. Like today, I said I've been doing housework. Um... Again, I am pregnant, so I do, and I'm in the third trimester, so I do get tired real quick, but um, I still, I've been trying to get everything done. I'm also in the, probably in the nesting phase, so I'm trying to get everything clean before she, our baby girl gets here, but I also need to listen more. I feel like I'm a good listener, um, 
but at the same time, I feel like I need to be better when David talks because he is kind of a talker. <laughs> and, um, I don't know. I just feel like I need to do it more for him, listen more. Kindness makes a husband curious to discover what his wife needs, then motivates him to be the one who steps up and ensures those needs are met, even if his are put on hold. Next is willingness. Sorry if I'm sniffling and my nose is, I have allergies. <laughs> Kindness inspires you to be agreeable. Instead of being obstinate, reluctant, or stubborn, I underline stubborn because I'm very stubborn. You cooperate with you stay flexible. Rather than complaining or making excuses, you look for creative ways to accommodate and adjust. A kind husband ends thousands of potential arguments by his willingness to listen first rather than demand his ways. Jesus described the kindness of love in his parable of the Good Samaritan found in the Bible. Luke chapter 10. A Jewish man is attacked by robbers and then left for dead on a remote road. Two religious leaders, respected among their people, walk by without choosing to stop. Too busy, too important, too fond of clean hands, but a common man of another race, the hated Samaritans, whose dislike for the Jews was both bitter and mutual sees a stranger in need and is moved with compassion. Crossing all culture boundaries and risking ridicule, he stops to help the man. Bandaging his wounds and putting him on his own donkey, he carries him to safety and pays all of his medical expenses out of his own pocket. Where years of racism has caused strife and division, one act of kindness brought two enemies together. Taking the initiative, this man demonstrated true kindness in every way. Gently, helpfully, willingly. Jesus illustrated how love could cause even enemies to reach out to one another in kindness. If enemies can do it, how about intimates? How might love ramp up the level of kindness in your relationships, in your marriage? Wasn't kindness one of the key things that drew you and your spouse together in the first place? When you married, weren't you expecting to enjoy his or her kindness for the rest of your life? Didn't your mate feel the same way about you? Even though the years can take the edge off that desire, your enjoyment in marriage is still linked to the daily level of kindness expressed, it fuels mutual delight. The, the Bible describes a woman whose husband and children bless and praise her. Among her no noble attributes are these. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Proverbs 31, 26. Again, in Proverbs, this is actually my favorite chapter, chapter of the book, I guess you say, is Proverbs 31. It, it's pretty much tells, or it says, like, like I just said, the Bible describes a woman whose husband, children, bless and praise her. It explains how, I guess, a woman should be. Some people are, say that it maybe go too, old to, too far, but I don't believe that. I believe it's something you should strive to be the best wife and uh, mother that you can be. And this explains what that looks like. Um... It goes on to say, I think I'll also be, I want to do uh, um, some challenges with Proverbs 31. But anyway, let's keep going. Um, how about you? How would your husband or wife describe you in the kindness matter? How harsh are you? How gentle and helpful? Do you wait to be asked mm -hmm. or do you take initiative to help? Don't wait for your spouse to be the, be kind first. Make it your daily mission. Um... I'm pretty kind, and I don't think I'm harsh. Not too harsh, anyway. I I think I'm gentle, but I definitely need to work on being helpful. Like I said before, I like to procrastinate, and 
it always doesn't really get me to where I need to be, <laughs> um, especially with like house household like chores and stuff. Um, it is difficult to gem demonstrate love when you feel little to no motivation, and that's a that's me. I I do have I feel like I don't have much motivation sometimes to do stuff. But love in the truest sense is not based on feelings. Rather, love determines to show thoughtfulness actions even when there seems to be no reward. You will never learn to love until you learn to demonstrate kindness first. All right, today's dare. It says, in addition to saying nothing negative to your spouse, again today, like yesterday, do at least one expected gesture as an act of kindness. So that is what I'm going to be working on today is an unexpected gesture as act and kindness. All right, I'll end it right there and stay tuned and see what I do. Hi guys, sorry I look scary again. I'm just so tired that I just don't feel like putting any makeup on. But um, this is, I am updating you on my dare from the Love is Kind. And last night, I greeted David when he got home from work with a big smile and a kiss. And also, some other things I did that were kind was I just, um, I made him a pretty big meal for dinner, which exhausted me. <laughs> because um, I am three, my third trimester, but I still wanted to be kind and feed him. Um, they say that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, I usually try to cook um, dinner every night, so that's one thing. Also, um, I didn't procrastinate and I did some house cleaning. So, yeah, um, I feel like that was me being kind. And I, I mean, that's, that's where I'm starting. Um, I'll definitely uh, keep trying to figure out new ways to be kind. And I haven't said anything negative, so that's good. But, yeah, that's my dare for yesterday. Okay, guys, so it is day three of the Love Dare challenge. And, again, it's the night time. That's why I'm not wearing any makeup again and in, in, the, in my pajamas. But um, I wanted to go ahead and do the day three, and it is Love is Not Selfish. It says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Romans 12, 10. Selfishness and love are in a constant opposition to one another. While love asks us to deny ourselves for the sake of someone else, selfishness compels us to focus on ourselves at, our, at their expense. Selfishness is like a disease that suffocates our capacity to love. When we choose self-centeredness, we become higher maintenance, more needy, overly sensitive, demanding. And then when we don't get our way, we judge others harshly while others blind to our own face. Faults. Sadly, we live in a world that is enamored with self. The culture around us teaches us a focus on our personal appearance, feelings, and desires as the top priority. We despise this trait in other people, but justify it in ourselves. I deserve, and I expect, and I want are appetizers we use to feed our selfishness. Regret regrettably, these selfish tendencies are ingrained into every person from birth. You can see it in the way young people act, or young children act. And I underlined it. You can see it in the way young p children act. And I wrote James because he's at the age when everything revolves around them. <laughs> And often in the, the way adults use and mistreat one another, almost every sinful action can be traced back to selfish motive. And its dangers become painfully apparent once inside a marriage relationship. 
Marriage exposes our selfishness in living color. When a husband puts his interests, desires, and priorities ahead of his wife, he is flying a, a flag of his own selfishness. When a wife constantly complains about the time and energy she spends meeting the needs of her husband, she's revealing her selfishness. Moodiness and complaining are selfishness is disguise in disguise. All right. Laziness, I underline laziness because that's me, <laughs> and irresponsibility are often mask and wares, boasting and bragging, being easily angered, talking too much, never listening. The list goes on and on. Even generous actions can be selfish if the motive is to gain bragging rights and re receive a reward. In reading this, did you focus just now on your partner's tendency to do some of the things but ignore your own? Why do we have such low standards for ourselves and yet such high expectations for our mate? The answer is a painful pill to swallow. We all struggle with selfishness. I'll say it again. We all struggle with selfishness. The bottom line is this. You either make decisions out of love for others or love for yourself. And I underlined it. You either make decisions out of love for others or love for yourself. But love does not seek its own. 1 Corinthians 13.5 It's beautifully fine its satisfaction in the welfare of others. And I underlined it. Um, but love does not seek its own. 1 Corinthians 13.5 it beautifully finds its satisfaction in the welfare of others. Loving couples is, in loving marriages are bent on humbling themselves and making good care of other flawed human with whom they have chosen to share their lives. They understand by getting married, they are giving their self away and releasing the right to live the rest of their lives for themselves. And I underlined it, releasing the right to live the rest of their lives for themselves. And I wrote in the margin, but it's the same when deciding to have kids. When you decide to have kids, you're releasing the right to live the rest of your life for yourself. <laughs> because it seems like it always goes towards the kids. Or in this case, your spouse. You should put your spouse in front of your, your kids. I know that. It's putting the happiness of their partner before their own. Choosing to love your mate will cause you to say no to what you want so you can say yes to what you need, what they need. It doesn't mean you cannot enjoy any personal fulfillment, but you don't negate the happiness of your spouse to enjoy it yourself. Love also leads to inner freedom. It helps liberate you from the anxiety of unrealistic expectations and unmet demands. By prioritizing the well-being of your mate, you experience a fulfillment that cannot be duplicated by selfish actions. And I underlined this that too. By prioritizing the well-being of your mate, you experience a fulfillment that cannot be duplicated by selfish actions. Unselfish people are perpetual delight. They make amazing friends and spouses. They are willing to set their own jealousy and demands aside and lose themselves in the joy of loving, serving, and giving to another. Often this is practiced by simply allowing your mate a few seconds to go first, speak first, or be served before you are. The more you learn to resist your own selfishness day daily, the stronger, more lovable, and happier you will become. Nobody knows you as well as your spouse, and that means no one will be quicker to recognize a change when you deliberately start sacrificing your wants and wishes to make sure his or her needs are met. They may welcome it with a warmth of slightly suspicious. They, they may welcome it with warmth or be slightly suspicious, but they will likely notice it. If you find this day's challenge hard to swallow or, and are frustrated with the idea of sacrificing your own desires to benefit your spouse, then you may have a deeper problem with selfishness than you want to admit. Ask yourself these questions. Do I truly want what's best for my husband or wife? Yes, I do. Do I want them to feel loved by me? Yes, of course. Do they believe I have their best interest in mind? 
I asked David this and he said yes. I also asked David, do you, well, it says, do they see me as looking out for myself or them first? And I asked David that and he said that he thinks it's equal. Um, I put myself first sometimes, but I also put him first and then sometimes when needed, I put James first, which I guess in this, what I'm reading, it means I need to work on putting David more first. Um, remember your partner also has a challenge of learning to love a selfish person, but don't wait on them to earn your love. Determine to be the first to demonstrate real love to them. With your eyes wide open, show them what it looks like by your unexpected example. And when all is said and done, you'll both be more fulfilled. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Philippians 2, 3. And another Bible verse is, Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder. James 3, 16. And then one person who... It has a quote down here from a guy named Joe, and it said, For the first time in my life, I am doing things the right way. I am really learning how to love her and how much I love her. How sweet is that? Okay, um, so I, since the end of the night, I've already done today's dare. And uh, it said, Whatever you put your time, energy, and money into will become more important to you. It's hard to care for something you're not investing in, along with refraining from any negative comments by your spouse something that says, I was thinking of you today. And um, that was today's dare. And it says, whatever you put your time, energy, and money into will become more important to you. I underlined that. And I spent a lot of money and energy and time w with James, which... I don't think he's wrong because he's my son and he's only three. He needs all that. But I'm, I'm thinking maybe I should start switching a little more of my time, energy, and money into from James to David. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to be working on. Um, um but see, I was supposed to buy something for David today. It says something I was thinking about you today. Um, I was going to buy David something small at the grocery store. A little gift. He um, really likes a certain kind of beef jerky. But, and I was just going to buy him that because I know that he really likes it. And I thought he would like it. But he ended up going to the grocery store with me today. So I was not able to sneak it in. But um, Christmas is actually in two days. And I think I've bought him some um, thoughtful gifts. But um, I know that means I should be doing that anyway because it's Christmas. But I usually, when I'm at the grocery store, if I see something that I think he's like, I will pick it up for him. So I feel like... I am pretty good at buying him things when I think he, when I'm thinking of him, or I think I'm pretty good at buying him things when I see something and I'm like, oh, I think he'll like that, so, and I'm always thinking about him every single day, so, um, I did say something negative to him today, it, um, you know, not perfect, so, and little things like that's going to happen. Um, I felt bad right after I said it, but, um, I, he, we were putting groceries up from the grocery store after shopping, um, and there, we had some leftover food that he was like, are you going to eat this? And I was like, no, are you going to eat it? And he was like, no. And he said, and then there was something else that we had thrown away not very long ago that I made and I just couldn't finish it. And he said something along the lines like, I need to not make, it's usually chicken. I, can, I have a hard time eating chicken after I make it um, several days in a row. I'm weird like that. But um, he said something like, you don't need to make something 
a whole lot of something or anything. These aren't the exact words, but this is what he was meaning. If uh, if we're not going to be able to finish it because we're wasting money just throwing it out, which I agree, you know, we don't need to do that. We need to finish what we, what we eat, but it's hard for me to, to eat things. And so I just kind of snapped at him. I was like, well, if you don't like how I cook, then you can just do it yourself. And as soon as I said that, I felt bad. But, um, yeah, I need to work on me snapping when he starts I get real defensive when it comes to house cleaning or cooking because I want to be good at it and I don't think I'm bad at cooking I think I'm, a, I'm decent at cooking but um I know I could work on the whole house cleaning thing but anyway um so I got defensive and I snapped at him but I apologized at least I think I did I hope I did maybe I should go and apologize again but <laughs> but anyway um I'm going to stop this video right now I've been working on it for the past few days I'm not sure how long it's going this video is so I need to stop right now usually I'll try to do more days in the video but since I had like the whole introduction thing in it I know that means it's probably gonna be longer um but I hope you like this love there challenge if you do please give it a thumbs up and um, subscribe and hit that bell so so you'll never miss another video from us and um, also let me know what you think about this love challenge um, I've I want to add in more things like more like clips like today if I had bought David something at the grocery store I think I would have been like showed it to you that was my plan but um since he went, I wasn't able to do it, but I think I want to start adding in a little more clips like that just so it make it a little more interesting. Um, but if you have any other ideas or comments, please leave them below, and I will see you next time. All right. Bye, guys.